This is the Dempco Free Rain. And this is the Dempco Free Rain. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on these two knives, keep watching. All right, before we get started, I want to thank Dempco Knives for sending me both versions of the Free Rain so that I could share them with you. So the short backstory is that I did reach out to Dempco and asked if they'd be interested in sending me this, their drop point, almost spear point version. And they agreed to do that, but they also wanted to send along their American Tanto version. I agreed, of course, but Honestly, I wasn't sure what to expect because this is the first American Tanto style knife that I have owned. I've never used one for bushcraft. Well, I haven't used one at all. So I didn't know what to expect when I began my testing, but I was very pleasantly uh, surprised and I'll talk about my experiences with the Tanto in a few moments time. So what we're gonna do, of course, is we're gonna focus in a little bit closer on the knives. Where I'll go over their specifications. I'll go over their key features. I'll go over their design. And then of course, we'll do some testing. All right, once again, before we take a closer look at the knife, there is a few things I want to address. Issues or complaints that I saw other reviewers make in other reviews of these two knives. Because of course what I do before I start even testing my own knives is see what else is out there in terms of comments, reviews, that type of thing. Things that I should watch out for. And here's what a couple of other reviewers commented on. There are really basically three different complaints with these knives and I'll address each one of them. One of course is the price. This is not a cheap knife. It is not a budget knife. It comes in at $149.99 US dollars, so 150 US dollars. And while that in itself is not overly expensive for a knife, for a knife that is made in Taiwan, it seems to be more expensive than it should be. But there is reason for that that I'll get to in a few moments time. The second comment had to do with rusting. Well, let me talk about that. So these blades, both of them of course, are made of Japanese AUSA 10 or AUS 10 A steel, which is a high carbon stainless steel that is of high quality nature, great in terms of edge holding as well as toughness and will take a very fine edge and still be relatively easy to sharpen. It's kind of one of those balanced knives. I guess if you're not familiar with AUS 10A steel, it is an upgrade from AUS 8A steel, which most people have heard of. So it is roughly equivalent to 440C steel, which is a high quality steel, but it has improvements over that. So it's a good quality steel and it is not prone to rusting. But where the complaint came in was an observation that one of the reviewers made in that the rubber is a little bit, craton is what it is of course, is uh, you can probably see if I pull on it hard a little bit of a gap forming right at where the rubber meets the handle and I mean very little gap right there. And the comment was this, that the reviewer felt that these would rust down inside. Now this is a full tang knife, as you can see, there's the protruding pommel, but it is a hidden tang, so it is not a full broad tang, and that the water would get down inside and eventually cause some rust underneath the rubber scales, the craton scales. Well, I put that to the test and I can dismiss that right now. I put this into a pan of heavily salted water. In fact, I'll roll in a bit of footage on that in just a few moments time so you can see the testing I did. And uh, yeah, there was no rusting on this. So I don't consider that a concern. Is it possible? Yeah, I guess it's possible. All steel will rust. And I guess water could migrate down inside of that. But uh, I honestly, I don't see it. I have, there was no rust formed on this, at least during my testing. So I don't consider that much of a complaint. Now, the last complaint, I don't know how to take this, but they felt it would be uncomfortable. Now, let's just address the elephant in the room. This bears a striking resemblance, in some ways at least, to the cold steel SRK in that it has a rubber over mold handle made of the same material, craton. I've previously reviewed that knife and uh, uh, well I'm not going to go back and, and go into that knife at all but the difference between the handle on that knife and this knife is that this checkering and it was more of a dimpling on the other knife extends all of the way around the handle. And the uh, fact that this has a smooth back and smooth underneath, the reviewer felt that it would be slippery in the hand. Yeah, I don't know where they came up with that, honestly. There's nothing slippery about this knife. There's no way of me showing you and demonstrating how well this grips in the hand. But I'll tell you, by comparison with the Cold Steel SRK, this is a much better feel in the hand. And I'll relate that to the 
width in this direction to the thickness in this direction. It really does work much better. In fact, with the Cold Steel SRK, it's almost a block square. This is actually a much more comfortable grip and a much grippier grip than the SRK. So we'll dismiss that right now. Now let's go back to the first issue of concern and that is the price. What makes this knife worth 150 US dollars? And I say this knife and it could be the other knife as well because they're both exactly the same price. Well, AUSA or AUS 10A steel is not entry grade, it's not a super steel, but it is a high quality steel. There is a price associated weighted with that. Yes, they are made in Taiwan, but one of the things that people often don't take into consideration when they look at the price of a knife is the sheath itself. So let's just take bring the sheath back into the picture. And now let me put the knife in the sheath so you can see it goes in. It goes in really, really really secure so secure when i first got it i thought man that's hard to get out it is loosened up a little bit but you can see it still snaps in nicely and it's got great retention not that you need it but it does have a secondary retention with a nylon strap there are some similarities between this and the cold steel srk but there are some significant differences at the same time the uh, basic similarities is both steel or both sheaths do use fiber uh, glass injected fiber or fiberglass injection molded sheath but only this one only uses it in part i'll explain that in a moment both have a nylon belt loop with a dome snap and velcro so that you can take it on and off of your pants or off of your belt without undoing and taking the belt right off both can be reversed for left hand carry so you can take this belt carry off reverse it around and set it up for left hand carry if that's what you want to do that's where the sheaves similarities end now here's where the difference is this is a better sheaf just simply put this is a much better sheaf than the one that comes from cold steel reason being is the fiberglass injected nylon is only on the outside the frame of the sheaf not in the inside this is fiberglass but or not fiberglass this is nylon but not fiberglass injected nylon now what's the significance there when they say fiberglass injected nylon uh, what they mean is it's literally glass there's glass in the nylon glass fibers and those glass fibers are actually harder than steel so a lot of these nylon sheaths can actually dull your blade from putting it in and out of the sheath. If the edge comes in contact anywhere with the nylon, it can dull the knife. Now, it's not going to happen every time or, or, you know, significantly when you put it in, but in and out over time, it will dull the knife. And it's just unnecessary because if you look at what Demco Knives has done, they've created a two-part sheath. This is structurally fiberglass, makes it very tough, very hard. And the center part is uh, not fiberglass, but it is nylon. This sheath, by the way, can be disassembled if you want to take it all apart for maintenance, cleaning it out, because, of course, that's another issue with a lot of sheaths. You can't get them apart if you get gunked down inside. This, you can do exactly that, take it apart. So this sheath has the advantage of not in any way offering the opportunity for the edge to come in contact with the fiberglass nylon just the simple nylon therefore it will not dull the knife so that's part of what uh, it costs extra on this is that the sheaths take quite a bit more machining that's where the extra nut cost comes in with this knife all right now let's take a look at the design itself all right you know i don't think i mentioned this yet and that is who the designer of the free rain is and that is andrew demko andrew demko used to work for cold steel knives for a long long time in fact many of the more popular designs coming out of cold steel were designed by andrew at least as far as the folding knives go so when andrew finally stepped out on his own his bread and butter really are his folders and he has some very unique designs with some very very popular locking mechanisms that are especially strong but he does have a few fixed blades the free rain being probably the most popular of them so Andrew Demko is the designer of these knives and it is an American designer and this is an American company while oh, here's another thing I should mention right up front when I spoke to the Demp people at Demko Knives they did say yes this is made in Taiwan in fact you can probably see it right down there However, they were excited to tell me that they will be producing this exact knife in the U.S. 
made from magna cut steel. So that's kind of exciting. I think an American made magna cut steel knife with high design characteristics, I think really is a winner. So let's get back to the design of this knife. First, let's go through a few of the specifications. So this will apply to both knives because they're virtually the same except for the blade shape itself. Overall length, nine and three quarters inches, which is 247.65 millimeters. Handle length, four and five eighths, 117.47 millimeters. Blade length, exactly five inches, 127 millimeters. Blade height from spine or tip to spine is one and one quarter inches or 31.75 millimeters. Blades thickness, and this is quite thick for a knife of this design, three sixteenths of an inch or 4.76 millimeters. And as I mentioned, they are made from AUS 10A steel, which has been hardened to 60 on the Rockwell scale. And the handle material, as mentioned, of course, is craton, very similar to what is used on cold steel knives, but better. I think that's the best way to say it. Okay, now let's just talk about the design of these two knives. This, of course, being the drop point design, almost a spear point. I think it's pretty much center point on the knife itself. Uh, by the way, they do come in different colors for the handle. This one comes in, I believe it is gray as well, and the other one was, comes in in green uh, that I have and gray. So as I mentioned, it is a full uh, tang a full tang knife, protruding pommel, nice, quite sharp actually if you like those full tang knives, but it is still a hidden tang, so it is not a full broad tang inside of here. There is a little bit of jumping and just little jumping, just three little divots is really all it is. High saber grind, quite high. It's two thirds of the way up of the knife, making it slicey for what it is. And here's the thing about this knife. Look how thick the point on that is. For a saber grind, this is an especially stout knife. Now, let's just bring the American Tantal back into the picture, talk about it for a minute. So again, specifications are the same for all the um, features on this knife. The only difference being, of course, is this has the American Tantal style. Again, saber grind, not quite as tall, but almost two thirds of the way up. Same divots right here for jimping. And the American, now look at the point on that. And this is one of the things, of course, the American Tanto design is supposed to be especially good at. And that is deep penetration because it has a very pointy tip on it, but very, very strong at the same time and should not break off. I mean, you can break any knife with enough effort into it, but this is much, much stronger. And one more thing I'm going to say about the Tanto design, and I'll be demonstrating this in a few minutes, is the advantage I didn't see when it came to carving. So I guess most people, myself included, do not consider a Tanto to be a bushcraft knife. It is primarily a military or self-defense or offensive weapon, either way you want to look at it. Can it actually be used for bushcraft? Well, I, I've discovered that it can. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail and how well it works. I'll probably do that in another video, but I will uh, go over how I've found that you can use those two tips in conjunction or independently each other and still do a really good job of most of the bushcraft tasks. All right, I think we've talked about the design well long enough. What I'll do before going rolling into the demonstrations is just roll in that little bit of footage that I have of my rust tests for this knife. All right, let's start this test. So I have oh, about a third of a cup of salt here and about a liter, maybe a liter and a half of water. So of hot tap water, that is hot tap water. That just helps to dissolve and disperse the salt around a little bit more, put it in solution, and uh, quite hot actually. But that's way in excess of any saltiness you're going to get in the ocean. So uh, let's put it in. All right, knife is in there. I'm going to leave it for probably an hour or so, and then we'll take it out and let it bake in the sun here, and we'll see what happens. All right, knife has been sitting in the sun for a little over an hour. Let me bring it in a little closer and see if we can spot any rusting. I thought I saw some discoloration here, but no, nothing at all so far. 
All right, let's just place it in the sun now for another hour. All right, I brought the knife indoors so I could get some better lighting and uh, less wind noise to do this. So we're examining the knife. It was in that super saturated salt water for well over an hour and it just laid out in the sun for a little over two hours before I brought it in. So let's take a look at it. So what you can see, try not to get too much glare on it, is certainly the salt is crusted on the outside of the steel. I'm seeing, all right, let's close examine it. I'm not sure, let's see. Can you see that little dot on the spine? That may be a little bit of rust. Uh, maybe not, let's see if it wipes off. Oh, it just wiped right off, okay. <laughs> maybe it wasn't rust at all. Now, to address the concern that was expressed is did it get down inside? I don't think I can even open that up. I gotta get a flashlight. Let's take a look. I'll take a look and then I'll see if I can't. It's just gonna focus. Don't think it is. Let's see, how am I gonna do this there? I'm not seeing anything down inside there at all. Other side. Nothing. There's no, I don't think water even got down inside there. I think it is tight enough. The material is tight enough to the metal that it's not even letting water down inside. You know, I'm looking at that. That may actually been the starting of rust right there. But if it is, it's the only spot on the knife. Now, certainly this is not a definitive test. This was just a, a well, very light test, although it's super saturated with salt, as you can see by the crusting on the knife. But I think it should put to rest the concern about one, AUS-10 being prone to rust, and two, whether or not water will get down inside there and cause rust inside. All right, when it comes to demonstrating the knives, what I think I'll do is I'll just move back and forth between the two knives just to give you an idea that both knives are capable of all the tasks that I'm going to be doing with them. First task will be batoning. Now, this is a piece of well-seasoned maple, and it is two, two and a half inches in diameter. 13, almost 14 inches in length. So this is a good task. I think there it may be a knot under this section of it. I think you could probably baton larger pieces of wood than this if you can span it. Likely you can baton it with this knife. But honestly, I think it's just about any knife that, um, or any baton I'm gonna do with any knife, this is as large as I'm likely to do. I can probably demonstrate it on a larger piece of wood, but I'm not sure that it makes a whole lot of sense to do it because that's not what I baton. Nothing really larger than this. So let's get this done. I have a new block that I'm uh, batoning on. It's just a little bit of movement. Let's do it up here and see if this is any better. Boy, this is a hard piece of wood. This was definitely harder than I anticipated. But I guess it makes a good demonstration of what this can take in terms of use. And you know what? This is not maple. This is oak, which is, makes it just that much harder. And there we go. Yeah, let's just take a look at the wood. No, it is maple. I was wrong. It is hard and seasoned maple. So rock maple at that. But first test, looking at that. If you know that knife is warm from having put that through the wood. All right, I don't see any edge rolls. I don't see any shininess on the edge. I don't see any chips. And still appears to be as sharp as it was before it began. All right, so that is splitting. I need to split the rest of these out so that I can create some smaller sticks for the rest of these demonstrations. So I'll do that now. All right, I thought I'd throw in one more demonstration before we get to making some feather sticks out of those, that other piece that I just cut through. And the reason I'm doing this is of course, these really are survival knives. They're not bushcraft knives by design. Having said that, they're very capable of bushcraft tasks. Maybe not with the same finesse that a smaller knife is, 
but certainly, as you will see, it, they can do all the bushcraft tasks. But what about survival tasks? Well, certainly wood splitting, wood prep for a fire is a survival task, but so is a lot of other things like shelter building. And that means working with larger pieces of wood like logs or trees and either taking down a standing tree with a knife or at least cutting it to length. So that's what I thought I would just demonstrate with this. This is an inch and a half in diameter. It is a little older, but I still think it'll make a good demonstration. So what I'm going to do is a straight on cross baton. I'm just going to pound straight through the, uh, the piece of wood. Let's switch it up and do a different knife this time. Straight through the piece of wood and just cross batoning. Now, the reason cross batoning is harder on a knife, of course, is because you're going cross the grain. If the knife was upright, you'd be going with the grain and hopefully it just splits apart. That's what batoning is all about. But cross batoning, that's another animal. It can be a lot harder on an edge. So I haven't done that with this knife before. So let's just see how this works out. Get my fingers out of the way. I would say that went through easy enough. Nicely clean. Take a look at the edge. I don't see any light coming off of it. So no rolled edges. What's that? No, that's just a little bit of dirt. That's all that is. Yep, okay, so not a very, very extreme test. Still sharp all the way down. Not an extreme test, but demonstrates that without any issue, it can cut at least this piece of wood. And I know it likely will do much better or do it even on much bigger pieces of wood. All right, we've already established that these knives are great at cross batoning, but we still have to create a notch on our tent peg. So just go in a little ways there. These are much easier to control than you might think for a knife of its size, but a lot of that has to do with the saber grind. Makes it, you know, still fairly thin at the edge, given the height and the height of the saber grind. You still have quite a slicing knife at the edge, but a really, really thick spine on it. So, may not be a finesse carver, but it's certainly capable of doing the job of carving. L7s for a tent peg. All right, I still have to put a point on this, of course. All right, switching back and forth between the two knives, I've just moved back over to the Tanto. There's my tent peg notch. Ah, the wood's still pretty good, I guess. Let's do reverse grip and chest lever. Certainly, wow, okay, yeah. Definitely biting in. That was a point in no time at all. So here is my thoughts on it. It's not the best for holding in reverse grip. Not bad, but not the best. I can't, re I can hold it like this, as you can see, with my thumb over top of my fingers, and I have good control over the knife. And the bird's beak at the bottom, here at the pommel, does ride down below the edge of my palm. But if I want to hold it like this, with my thumb on the blade, not quite as comfortable because now it moves up into my palm. Now, again, this is mitigated by the fact that it is rounded and made of rubber. So it's not near as uncomfortable as it might have been otherwise. And to be honest, I'm not doing this for extended periods of time like this. Still, I've got knives that are much more comfortable to use because of a different design in the handle. Still works though. All right, definitely one of the tasks we want from a bushcraft knife is to be able to create feather sticks or survival knife for that matter. And I'm just clearing a little bit of the bark off here because uh, the center of the wood is nice and dry, which is the reason why you split it out. But the outside under the bark was definitely wet. So I'm just looking for a nice spot. I think I can create a few feathers down there. Let's just have a look. If I can keep them on the stick that is. All right, it's creating feathers, nice fine feathers. Of course, I'm working on a very thin edge right now. And they're curling up pretty good. All right, move it along a little quicker here. So definitely, I have knives that are better at doing this. I don't think I have anything this size 
that can do as good a job at this. This size meaning this thickness. 3 16th is not what you call a thin, slicey knife. Having said that, that high saber and the height from the spine to the edge creates quite a thinness at the edge itself. Thin enough that you can still do some reasonable feather sticking with it. But again, you've got all of that strength that you would want in a survival knife. I'm actually enjoying using this much more than you might think. Another advantage of the Kraton handle is it may not be as thick as I like my bushcraft knives to be, but it has definitely got the height top to bottom, which is one of the things I talk about often enough. But because of the gripping of this Kraton, I can loosen my grip, hold it loosely in my hand, and still have the control over it to get some really fine little curls running down the stick here. I wonder if I can show you what I'm getting for fine curls. Little, little tiny curls that would accept a spark from a ferrocerium rod. Speaking of ferrocerium rods, let's do a little bit of scraping. All right, when it comes to scraping, three types of scraping I like to have, have my knives be capable of. One is scraping wood. Uh, let's start, yeah, let's start here. Just to create some fuzz off of the stick itself. Definitely doing that. Yep. Creates that type of fuzz easy enough. My fat wood, let's put the little fuzziness. I'm working on a little piece of birch bark here, of course. Fat wood. Yep. There's my fat wood scrapings. Ferrocerium rod. That's better. Throw those little pieces on, and maybe even that feather I created a second ago. All right, and one last demonstration, and then we'll wrap this video up. And this is something you have never seen me do with another knife. Well, maybe it have a couple of times, but this is not something I do with most of the knives, and that is a tip test to see whether or not, not to see if I can break it, just to see if it can handle reasonable uh, penetration into wood with sideways lateral forces. Now, this being the tantal, you would expect that this will do a good job. So I have a nice big heavy piece of maple here. I'm getting some good penetration and <laughs> no deformation whatsoever. That's exactly what I would have expected. This knife equally as thick. Let's do the same thing. Okay, I cannot foresee myself doing uh, more work than this using a for penetration uh, because I don't, I'm not trying to bust my knives. So that's more of a tip test than I would normally give most knives, but it's good to know that it's capable of withstanding that. Now let's wrap this video up. All right, a few closing comments for the Dempco Free Rain in both the Spear Point and the Tanto. And as I mentioned, I've been going back and forth because I don't know how else to demonstrate these two knives except switching back and forth in the different tasks. As far as all of the tasks that I've demonstrated, with the exception of the carving, I would say there's really not much of a difference between these two knives at all. This does have a nice spear point, almost perfectly center line, just maybe just above center, which means it should make it easy for drilling into wood. I've drilled into wood with this as well. Maybe not quite as good as the spear point, still does a good job and has a plenty strong tip. All right, so using the Tanto for bushcraft, that was brand new for me. And I was pleasantly surprised with just how well it does in wood processing and a number of tasks like the carving over the other knife. Now they both have their place. I'm not gonna say one is better than the other. They just, they some have a little bit of advantage here and a little bit of advantage there. So if you're not ready to make the leap to a Tanto for bushcraft, then the spear point or drop point is perfectly capable of all of those tasks. These are nice knives. They really, really are. These are the type of knife that you're likely going to reach for because you have the confidence that it's going to withstand all the type of use you're likely to put it for, even if it's not as much of a finesse knife as maybe some Mora's or some custom carving knives are. Overall though, 
I'm extremely pleased with these and I'd love to get my hand on the Magna Cut version made in the US so I can test that for all the, I've never tried a Magna Cut knife before. Maybe that's the reason why I want it so much. I'm really happy with these. It would have to go a long ways to beat these two knives. So are they a little bit expensive? Maybe for a knife made in Taiwan, but when I look at the quality of these knives and when I look at the multi-part sheath and the quality and the engineering that went into that, I can understand why the price is a little bit above the average. Okay, I think I've gone on long enough about these knives. These are still very, very capable knives. Either one would be a good choice for someone who's looking for a knife. Let's put it this way. Let Maybe this is the best way to wrap it up. This is what the Cold Steel SR key could have been. This beats the SR key hands down. And I know that's going to offend a few people because I've a lot of people commented how nice they or how much they love their SRK. And I, and I have that one that I tested and I like it too. I won't do that tip test you just saw me do. So maybe that says something right there. It's a little bit shorter, absolutely. But uh, I would sooner grab this than the SRK any day. Okay, that's all I have. I'll put all the specifications for the knife in the video description, as well as the links to Demco knives where you can take a second look at these if you're interested. If you have any comments or questions, put them in the comments section below. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less travel because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.